thank you all, first of all, to Jack, Beth, Carl and Sarah, um, all leaders within the space. Um, and we're incredibly lucky for you to have offered your time today to share your insights and expertise when it comes to such an important topic of how to drive engagement with well-being. I talk about it regularly, that there's no point in building if you're building a world leading technology product or if you're part of an EAP, for example, there's no point in having something that's excellent if it doesn't get used. And that's the number one topic that comes up with leaders um, across organizations, well-being champions, is how can we drive engagement? Now, the big issue with engagement at the moment is there are so many other competing demands when it comes to well-being. There are so many things going on in employees' lives, but also whether employees want to prioritize well-being is another big area as well. And so what we're going to do today is go through the ways that you can just increase your engagement with well-being. And the stat that I saw recently was that on average, 3% of employees within our organizations access employee assistance programs that many of us offer, the counseling programs that many organizations offer. But Champion Health's research and data shows that over 25% of employees at any one time are experiencing moderate to severe depressive symptoms or symptoms of anxiety. So there's a huge disconnect at the moment between certain people and populations that are struggling not accessing that help, but also how can we keep people thriving inside and outside of the workplace and get them engaged with well-being. So a huge welcome to all of you that have joined today. The key thing for me is that we want to answer your questions. We want this to be all about you. There's no point in us talking about well-being. We could probably talk about it for hours and hours and hours down the pub. But what we want to be able to do is find out what are your challenges and how can we assist you in being able to resolve them and drive engagement beyond this. Now, there's going to be so many things to take away from here. I'm going to be scribbling down notes in my notebook next to me right here. But if you can take away one thing from this live session, from this live panel, then we have done our job. The other thing to just touch upon is you will receive all of the slides and the recording after this session as well. And feel free to share that beyond as well um, within there. So who this session is for is for anyone that wants to prioritize well-being. That's who all of our sessions are for. I love this image, brings a bit of color to it, but we really want to be able to drive engagement, whether you have low engagement, moderate or high levels of engagement, this session is really for you. And as I mentioned before, we want it to be interactive. We want to find out the specific things that we can do or advice we can give to support you. Now, in terms of the panel today, uh, it's just that it's, I'm extremely fortunate to be able to host today's panel. So I'm Harry Bliss, CEO and co-founder of Champion Health. We've got Sarah Restall, and Sarah is, she's definitely won the best background out of all of the panelists without a doubt. That's Sarah's artwork. Sarah, make sure you send a link to your artwork as well um, within there. I definitely need to buy some for my walls. But Sarah is just a bundle of energy and expertise when it comes to well-being. Sarah previously works at Mind and is now the director of the Inside Out Leadership Charter. And if you've not seen it, please check it out. But Sarah is going to specifically talk about senior leadership within her and her expertise in terms of how to drive engagement. We then got Bethany Sampson, who is the people leader investors in people. Um, usually Bethany is hosting these kinds of events. So it's wonderful to be able to get your expertise, Bethany, instead of just joining up the dots within here. And so you're going to be sharing again how to drive engagement and how you found that with investors and people internally, but also externally with the member base. We've also got Carl and I met Carl three years ago, very briefly at a workplace health conference and was blown away by the work that he was doing before well-being was, and dare I say, it's slightly trendy in some organizations. And Carl was really banging the drum about the importance of well-being and mental well-being specifically. And Carl has implemented world-leading strategies with the likes of Thames Water and is now an executive director at FYLD. And so we're extremely fortunate to have Carl join us today from Nottingham as well. And then we've also got Jack. Jack's a good friend of mine, a colleague as well. Jack's the head of performance at Champion Health. He's really looking to make well-being inclusive, accessible and engaging at the heart of it. Jack, in a past life, was a double Olympian as well and is an ambassador for Mind and Young Minds and has worked with the government on mental health reform. And we are extremely fortunate to be working alongside Jack at Champion Health. So that's the panel for today. Um, what we'll cover, there are five key topics that we'll look at. One is data. The other one is involving leadership, something that Sarah is hugely passionate about. The other one is building a team of advocates and well-being champions. How can we do that and how can we get the most out of them? And then the fourth element is engagement best practice. I'd also love to cover 
um, worst practice as well. And if we've made any mistakes, and I'm sure there have been things that we've tried to implement that have fallen flat on its face, then um, I'd love you to share that. And the final thing is making the most of technology. Um, we know that technology and the rise in digital technology in the wellbeing space is hugely important to be able to reach our large organizations and reach every employee. And so how we can get the most out of that technology will be covered within here. So I'm going to stop my screen share within, and so we can see all of the panelists' wonderful faces within. Um, and I'd love to get Sarah to kickstart the conversation on why is engagement relatively low at the moment and what can we do to be able to, to drive engagement going forward? Oh, thanks so much for a really hard question to start with, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that engagement is, is getting better. I think that it's something that needs to heat up. Uh, and I think that what we need to do is to stop thinking about it as something for mental health and start thinking about it initially as a cultural change. So what we need to do is just, is just turn it on its head and say what we're trying to do is because it makes business sense and because it's the right thing to do. So it's got both of those sides of it and set the cultural table, so to speak. So I think that it's quite... Um, difficult sometimes with organizations. I've been, I've been working with organizations for over six years and, and helping them with their mental health agendas. Yeah. And I think that it's quite hard sometimes to think, I want to do something for uh, members of staff who have mental health problems, but I'm not sure how to do it. And actually just stop thinking that way and instead think, I want to make this a culture where people feel safe and secure speaking about mental health, physical health, speaking about anything. So I, I always refer to it with the metaphor of being um, a table beneath a banquet. We've got so many different options of things that we can do to support mental health and well-being. So many different ways that we can we can do it, and it sometimes feels like a buffet or a banquet. But before you have your buffet laid out, so you can select all of those things appropriately that are best for the people, you really need a, a stable table, and that table needs to be your culture and. Spoiler alert, it's all about the senior leaders and it's all about having, having that set out from the beginning. What are your vision and values? What is it that you want to do for your staff? What is the culture you want to create? And I think that that's where we can start to kind of dig in and, and get that increase in engagement into the mental health agenda and into the well-being agenda and into the just the full stop health agenda. Let's start taking care of each other so that we can kind of take care of business as well I don't know if that helps at all it massively does and, and I'd completely agree that it's, it's around joining things up and getting the senior leadership buying and the minute you start talking about buffets you're talking my language there <laughs> as well um so so that's fantastic um Carl in terms of I saw you as a thought leader very early on within the space and before everyone was looking at mental health and well-being and, and when you were working in Thames Water and delivering keynotes um, around making well-being inclusive to everyone, um, especially in quite a hard to reach population. What were the specific challenges that you found there and how did you engage a hard to reach population and even a senior leadership team um, early on in really prioritizing well-being? I, I think we need to start, right? I, um, I remember the early days having conversations in, with the board, um, with, with Thames and the executive team. And it, it begins with getting the understanding. So when I took the position in the organization as the chief health safety and well-being officer and starting with, right, what does well-being actually mean? And the differences around the table and the understanding, because the problem at the time, you know, we're talking nine years ago now, you know, it means a state of feeling comfortable, healthy and happy, right? Now, when you start talking like that in a senior executive meeting, it sounds very flowery, right? So then you've got to kind of unpick it in terms of talking about, so psychologically, how do we understand, well, return on investment from our employees? And you're talking about organizational psychology that is made up of individuals. So after we started moving then deeper, and you can draw this out, right? Well, lots of people have, have experienced me drawing things on a whiteboard in different workshops. Um, but starting to get the executive to understand that, you know, um, so when, when I said, what's really important to you at the minute within the company, people being harmed at work, right? So injuries were top of the agenda within the organization at that point, you know, people being harmed, how do we stop that? 
And when you, when you start then to get them to understand it, that you cannot separate health from safety, same way you cannot so separate injury from illness, the reality is understanding the fact that the demands and pressures on modern day life and individuals um, actually resonates within the workplace that we know humans by their nature have slips and lapses in concentration, they make errors in judgment. We're not robots, we're gonna make errors, we fail. Yeah, and getting to understand that, that if we embed a culture and a philosophy around care, then we can have much better productivity, returns on investment. You know, you will have safer workplace because culturally people will naturally start to say, you know, oh, there's something wrong and they'll feel okay about it. But you can't do that unless you understand human psychology. So we started with the boardroom and educating the leadership around how do we move to a position where people feel comfortable bringing themselves to work. At work, they actually are allowed to speak openly and talk about challenges and issues psychologically that they face. And in turn, you will see naturally the long-term evolution of a culture that embraces and pats people on the back for saying there's something wrong. And the outcome of that is you'll have a much better and productive workforce. So that took years to start to embed that philosophy. Um, and you start to see the organization in a very different light and the leaders start to experience that. And it's, how, how long did it take approximately for the leaders to start to really buy into everything that you were saying? So I, I don't know, I, I have this image, it may be completely wrong and I may be making an assumption that there, there may have been tumbleweed when we were talking about mental well-being five, 10 years ago in the boardrooms, for example. Was that the case I, and how long did it take? I, I think it is. I think it's all down to how you explain it, yeah? yeah. So the one thing about, you know, um, people in my position that, you know, are leading major organizations is, you know, we, we've, we, we haven't just, you know, we got out of bed and suddenly woke up in a company. There's a, there's a history of 30 years of developing health and safety within organizations and understanding it. And then it's the, the, the ability to be able to communicate and articulate in a way that brings people with you. So it's not just a, a case of saying, you must comply with these standards or you're going to get harmed. It's a case of why do you need to comply, you know, and how do we do it and when do we do it and what happens if you don't. So we start to bring the workforce and the, the management and the leadership in with us. Um, and and you, could, you could talk for hours in terms of the psychology, but there's a lot, um, one of the things I always put across is there's a lot of academics saying what you can and what you should do. Yeah. And I found there was very few business practitioners 10 years ago saying, well, here's what I've done and here's yeah. the outcomes. And so as TEM started to introduce initiatives, waves of initiatives that were leading to outcomes, we started to share that openly with our peers around the water industry and then externally at all the conferences. And that allowed the movement to start where people saying, oh, I'll have that maturity model and that, you know, leadership program that you've put in place. And that started to bring that revolution into, into being. And I think lots of companies benefited from that sharing. Fantastic. Well, th thank you for sharing that, Colin. And I, I can see that um, firsthand from the amount that you've shared in terms of the excellent work that you were doing um, and you still are doing in, in the space at the moment. And moving on to yourself, Bethany, uh, Carl and, and Sarah have mentioned a top down approach within. Um, do you think it's all top down or do you think it's bottom up as well when we're looking to drive engagement and where have you seen engagement initiatives really succeed and, and what kind of initiatives have they been? Yeah, so I think um, I completely agree that you do need that top down approach too. Um, but I've also seen it work the other way. So um, if you've got a population that is active, interested in well-being, um, talking about it, pushing that, I think that is a real energy and a force that it makes sense to harness. Um, so one of the things we did at Investors in People is actually sort of create a, a group that we call the People Heroes. And I work with them to, you know, make initiatives happen, put events on, share resources, and just to kind of keep the conversation live and fun and happening um, to keep that energy going. And I guess from a slightly different angle, um, like my background is HR. And for some time, I was thinking, is this the career for me? I, I found I was feeling a bit like a, a kind of round peg in a square hole. I am, um, everyone that knows me knows I don't like processes and, you know, particularly structure um, and then what I kind of realized for me HR people practice is all about the human being you know that individual approach meeting people where they are and understanding what's going on for them 
So in that sense, I think that's also kind of a bottom up approach. If you've got an HR or people department that's driven by individual well-being and they're revisiting policies to put well-being at the heart of them, coaching line managers on how to have that well-being focused central approach, that's also a kind of sideways upwards yeah. bottom up. I don't know which way it goes. Yeah. Fantastic. And in terms of HR, I saw someone asking the question of are HR there to serve the company or to employees? Now, it's probably both and that, that may be the answer, but I'm really keen to hear your thoughts um, if you were to, to be asked that question. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and who hasn't struggled with that if you work in HR? I think, you know, it's almost an individual choice sometimes. My, my choice is it's always about the person. I don't think I could go to sleep at night knowing that I'd created an outcome where someone had gone home from work feeling worse than when they went in that morning um, even if it was for the company um, but I, I think it depends on what you want from your career that's that's the choice that I've taken. Brilliant and I think there's a theme already coming through that we want more human organizations within here um, and, and that's one of the things that I've taken already and Carl mentioning that they're people not robots um, completely agree within there as, as well and Jack morning um, so in terms of engagement um, what are the, the things that you've seen to, to really drive engagement when you were the BBC leader um, the BBC lead the well-being lead at BBC um, and all of the work that you've done as head of performance so far at Champion what really constitutes and drives engagement within organizations what I love about this, Harry, is that we work together and you haven't prepped me at all with the questions. I thought I was going to be uh, <laughs> going to get the inside track and you, you left it. Um, but for me, around engagement, a huge part of that is around the communications. Uh, we know they're, they're a huge ally within any organisation. That's how we, we get to our people. A big problem that we had at, at studios and other organisations that I've worked with is there are lots of, of initiatives and support in place, but no one knows where they actually are. There isn't that one hub, that, that place where wellbeing lives. So that was a big part of, of probably my job at, at BBC Studios was bringing the communications team in, also helping to educate them to understand what we want to get from wellbeing. And then trying to, for me, rebrand well-being as well. I talk about this quite a lot. Sarah has probably heard me talk about it too often. Um, but obviously from my former life as, a, as an athlete, I also coach athletes. I'm very much on the performance side of things. And I'm very passionate about if you are thriving personally and as a human being, you're more likely to thrive professionally. And when athletes talk about recovery, all they're talking about is well-being. Yet for some reason in normal life and within the business, we look at, at well-being as something that's soft, it's fluffy, it's a nice to have, as, as Sarah said earlier. And actually, it's the foundation of high performance. And for me, if we can then work with the communications team, not only to create that hub and keep continuously communicating about our well-being strategies and, and our culture, but if we can get them to communicate that change, that this is that that return on investment, a business case, it's the performance, it allows you to thrive, that's when you get people taking it seriously. Because if you just say, let's do some yoga and, and put some bananas on the end of tables, uh, you're not going to get the serious side of things. And, and actually, that's what's really important around well-being for me. Brilliant. Thank you for, for sharing that, Jack. We've had a lot of engagement already um, in terms of the chat. So we've got a lot of hello messages. We've got someone in the French Riviera, and I'm, I'm not at all jealous of that, um, just being being in the middle of Sheffield. Um, we've also got a question from Oliver um, around what wellbeing initiatives could I look at implementing that would keep not only uh, site staff, um, but management engaged in health and safety. And Carl, you mentioned really drawing um, health and safety together. They're not two separate things, they, they really do join up. What kind of initiatives did you find were successful um, that, that organizations can look to implement to keep that sustained engagement. Okay, so you, you've got to put in place a clear strategy. Um, but the way I would look at it, and the way I did look at it um, eight years ago, um, when I commenced in, in Thames and previous organizations in oil, gas and rail, um, is to not lose sight of what's already in place. So most people will develop a strategy about where they want to go, um, but anybody entering an organization, you've got to be able to hand to them, here's how things work within this company, because we lose all that knowledge. Um, if you look at your organization and a new person coming in and they want knowledge at that point, so have it all in there. So our strategy with Intense always had everything we were doing. 
So all the initiatives that have gone on just got added to the, here's how we work. These are all the things in place to support you within the well-being. And here's all the things we're looking to do also. Um, and then you've got to look at what are your aims. So you've got to capitalize on things like your leadership end. Yeah. Then your competency, upskilling of your employees, understanding the knowledge base and what needs to happen. Then you've got to look at how you engage. So, you know, there's different media and tools you can use to be able to, and what are the different channels of engagement, employee, line management, leadership, you know, um, and then you've got to look at communication. You've got to drip feed regularly communication. So having that as part of that strategy as well is equally important. So I think, you know, there's lots of um, great websites online uh, that are able to articulate you know, some good strategies that are available. And if you're really struggling, then drop me a note on LinkedIn and I'll send you something that will help. But you know what I mean? Ultimately, it's all, there's lots of stuff available, but that's sometimes an issue, right? Because yeah. there's so much resources. I think Sarah mentioned it earlier. There's so much resources available that sometimes you think, well, which one do I use? Um, and interestingly, it, it's something I was going to talk about later, but um, recently in conversations with the government, um, we recently pulled together uh, 25 business leaders with 15 government officials and brought them together in a workshop um, to be able to discuss um, uh, employers' mental health post-COVID and what are the steps that we need to take. So what are the instructions coming out from government? Because one thing the government has done well, in my opinion, throughout COVID is very pointed, instructive notes that everybody's able to say that's been released and we interpret it within a company and then are able to implement those standards around uh, to keep people safe throughout the pandemic over the last year and a half. Um, so we're looking forward and working with the government at the minute um, to be able to make sure we've got what, what companies need to focus on going forward. Because um, there's so much information. I, I, I completely hear that as well. Whenever we speak to HR leaders, CEOs, even employees, even my friends that are working within certain organisations, they say there is either they don't know where it is, and that's one issue, or there is so much that we don't know where to focus, and there's there's information overload within there. Um, and so that's a massive thing that I've I've heard multiple times. So again, completely agree with you there, Carl. Um, I'm not going to ask Jack and I'm not going to respond in terms of the initiatives because we're going to say Champion Health. So I'm going to move to Sarah in terms of other initiatives um, that are around. What have you found to be successful having worked at Mind and now a director at the Inside Out Leaderboard? What, what initiatives have your members found that have been very successful? Well, I, I think that we need to consider and I've just been avidly listening to Jack and Carl there. We need to consider uh, that not every organization is the same. So I always say, look at it in a bespoke way. And, I, and I'm, big, I'm big on the older metaphors and analogies today, but I often say, it's like you need to do a stock take first. So before you leap in and just kind of say, oh, I need an initiative and I'll grab this or I'll grab that. And, and there are some amazing ones and I will back Champion Health as well because I think it's awesome. <laughs> I do, you, you know that I love you guys. Um, but it's not just about plucking one out. It's about, first of all, doing a stock take. So I often describe it as being everyone has in their house the spice cupboard that has like a thousand-year-old saffron or some turmeric in there or a mix of dull stuff that you bought or some like really old province herbs, whatever it is in there. And, and often you end up just buying more and more and more because you're not quite sure what's in there. So my recommendation is to go back to what Carl was saying about strategy. As an organization, you are unique. You are not like everyone else. So first of all, take a really good look in your spice cupboard. Have a look at what it is that you need. Use data. I, I, I work with, uh, with Wellbeing for Carry as well, and they do a data collection. So use data to do that temperature check to see whether or not you can, what, what it is that you need. What are your staff asking for? So before you offer the provisions or, or say, oh, we'll just get in more things, have a look at what already exists. Ask people what they need. Coming back to what Jack was saying about communications and the, the organizations that I work with for the Inside Out Charter, this is often the first conversation we have. How do you communicate with your staff and how do you know that it works? And I'm just gonna give a really quick top tip because I'm sure that you're all out there scribbling down in your notebooks, all of these <laughs> golden gems that come out of our mouths. But with, with our charter members, the first thing that I'll say is, have a look at what already works. 
So how do you know how your staff and your employees are actually picking up information from you? If you are a head of HR and you are leading on the wellbeing initiative and you send out an email to everybody about Men's Mental Health Week, how are you measuring who's reading that email? And would it be different if that email came from the CEO's email inbox or outbox email address? There's my, I'm showing my, from his, from his pager. I don't know, show my age. But the <laughs> thing is, is that have a look, start measuring how people are clicking on your website, start understanding how people are receiving information and then use that information to give out more information, try it out. And it's a really lovely way to start engaging your senior leaders, by the way, to say to them, I want to try something. I believe that if you send an email from your email address, that all of our staff will read it. Can we measure it? Ask your IT team, ask your comms team to get involved and start doing that investigative piece, that stock take, what do we already have that works? And then take it from there. I think it's a, a hugely important point in terms of making sure that it's someone with a voice, someone that's very well respected within the organization that is communicating all of these areas. Um, we found that when an email is sent out about Champion Health Service, if we've launched in a company, engagement will increase by 20 to 30%. And that is a huge difference um, compared to if it's sent from another email, for example, something that we, we do recommend within there. So I completely agree, agree again with you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to move on to, to Bethany. Bethany, you've got a point. Sorry, I just saw your hand up. I hope you've not got an, an aching arm. Um, I've stolen that one from one of our team members. In all <laughs> no, um, I thought I but yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to build on what Sarah said, sort of from the, the spice cupboard analogy. I think um, thinking about my experience over my career, as well as looking to see what spices you already have that you can work with, it's also good to see what skeletons you have in the cupboard. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, the best one in the world, if you go out and you're telling people, you know, um, the importance of self-care, taking time during the day to do things that help you restore if you have a workload which is unmanageable or you have a senior leader who has toxic behaviors then you're not you're not having a, a sort of fertile ground for anything to flourish so i think there's also something around you know addressing any bigger issues that you have before thinking about launching initiatives and and making sure that you're really meeting those needs first I guess it's looking in the mirror, honestly, in terms of the organisation. And I, I've had friends, I speak to friends about workplace health, I'd love to hear their thoughts from the inside. And some of them work in organisations where some of the stories are remarkable, but then they'll say, well, here's a mental health platform and there's bullying that's going on across the organisation. And really, do you think that wellbeing can sometimes backfire in organisations that are treating it like a tick box rather than something that's embedded into the, the cultural fabric? That's a, a question for you, Bethany. Yeah, I, I do think it's, and it can be very demoralizing if you're the kind of HR person trying mm. to drive it in the right direction, but you can see that it's it's being undermined by practice in other areas, which is sort of directly impacting people's well-being. I guess it kind of comes back to Carl's point about treating things holistically. And it can be, those are sometimes the hardest conversations to have if you're given a directive to sort out well-being and you know that things are happening which are not right. But that's where perhaps sometimes having external support, someone to come and support you can be really helpful. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, we've got a question from Leah around, um, do you think that in a way, uh, EAP engagement is a sign of a more robust wellbeing strategy failing, as ultimately this is often the last resort? Um, really, really big question. Um, some people I've heard have said that engagement with the EAP means that people are actually using it, um, first of all. There inevitably are going to be people struggling with mental health issues. Um, but would that symbolize an increase in mental health issues if engagement increases? So I, I think that's gonna be a really tricky question. I'm gonna pass that one to, to Jack. Um, so really keen to hear your thoughts on that one. Really tricky, pass it to Jack. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> um, I have a few kind of opinions around EAP. I think firstly, it's not branded very well. Um, EAP doesn't sound good, doesn't sound like something I want to engage with and assistance just makes me feel like I, I need to seek the help rather than it being how we'd like it to be seen which is more proactive 
all, almost that that management rather than the uh, the crisis point. And that's the big point with EAPs is we put it out there and, and say that it's there for crisis typically within an organization rather than it being more proactive. And the other point is most people don't actually know what an EAP can provide. When you say to a lot of your organization, oh, you do realize you can get six counseling sessions through this for free. No one really knows about that. They also don't know that it covers a lot of well-being, not just mental health issues, whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's really important, just how we're pitching it and how we're then communicating it. Um, I feel like I'm repeating myself on communications and branding, but I think it's really important that that we kind of remodel how our EAP kind of sits within an organisation. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and we actually had a question beforehand from um, someone. I'm not actually going to name their name because of what they what they mentioned within. And they stated, so the average engagement with the AP that I mentioned earlier is that it's 3% of the whole organization. Um, now, this organization has had 12%, and lo and behold, the AP provider has turned around and then charged them four times as much um, across the next year. So just a message from me as much as anything is make sure you get the most out of your EAP provider, but make sure that they're not going to punish you for driving engagement. And that's something that you need to be very careful of when you're choosing the model to go for. That if it's on a um, just a price per employee unlimited access, lo and behold, you're going to get stung off the back of it and they don't want to drive engagement. So just be very wary of that as something I do shout about a lot um, to make sure when you sign up, you're signing up for the right thing and with the right people. Um, we've got quite a few comments I'd love to read out within here. If I don't get to read them out, then it's, it's, it, there's absolutely no reflection on it. And we'll also get round to any of the questions. We've got around 12 minutes left. Um, we'll make sure that we do get back to them um, via email if we don't get through to them. So Tasha mentioned that I think well-being should be written into performance frameworks within organisations. So conversations are happening within every one-to-one -one across the organisation. Embedding well-being into the culture lived and breathed throughout so I almost read that a bit like yourself, Sarah. So, uh, so it was everything that you've been saying. So Tasha um, is, is on the same page as you. Anne-Marie um, says, in HR, it's all about getting the balance and looking after the people, supporting managers and how to do that so they can uh, come to the correct decisions in looking after and supporting the people. Now, one thing that I want to move on to that we have had a question from is in terms of data. And we do need data to make informed decisions, whether we're building a marketing strategy, a sales strategy, a business strategy, or a health and well-being strategy. And so within data, we look at two things. There's employee wants and employee needs. Which one's the most important one to focus on? Sarah, I'm going to ask this to you. Um, and then I'll move across to Carl. Which one's the most important to focus on employee wants or employee needs or look at them both and see if they correlate? Uh, both of them. I, I, I would always gear with needs. And I, I also, I've always had this, um, maybe it's this blind optimism that actually it's not about being an employer and employees, but that, it, that work, is, work is something that's quite symbiotic and it's, it's very good for us. It's very good for human beings and it's good for the community and it all kind of comes together. It's not just these massive tin cans that we kind of pop into and pop out of in, in our daily lives. We, we as humans get so much out of being employed and it does fulfill our needs. Being employed fulfills our needs that we don't even know that we have. Like for example, the needs of, of that social communication. I know that there's no way I would have met half the people I know, maybe more than that, had it not been for my jobs. I wouldn't have been exposed to knowing older people and younger people than me or people from different cultures and backgrounds and with different religious beliefs than me. So work actually does provide us with things that we need to grow in ways that we don't even know or that we don't identify. So I think I'm going to go with needs. Have a look at employee needs. What does your what do your employees need to perform at their best? Because that in turn will cycle back on their wants. So maybe their wants are to sleep well and to feel fulfilled and to make really good connections and to feel like they're performing and to earn money and to do all of these things. These are quite classic top line surface wants. You can do that if you're taking care of them. If you're if you're not asking too much, if you're not burning them out, if you're not, if you're not, if your expectations are not outside of what performance can be. So yeah, I'm I've I've 
kind of gotten really passionate about thinking about <laughs> but it all it's all like a part of the same mechanism the same cog where we're both fulfilling each other and and it's it's wonderful and I and I don't just say that having like I, I think I work do the best job in the whole world and working for Rob at the inside out leaderboard is like the most fulfilling job anyone can have but I want you to know also I have cleaned toilets and pubs and still felt fulfilled because I was doing something as a part of a greater function and as a part of a bigger family so yeah wants and needs start with the needs you'll accidentally give them the wants Fantastic. Super. Great takeaways, Carl. In terms of wants and needs, um, and also looking at how to collect the data um, and what kind of data to collect, I'm really keen to hear, hear your thoughts on that. So data will lead to insights, which leads to actions. You, your list of KPIs will depend on your organization, but you've got to have a balance between proactive and reactive indicators that you need to measure. I have no doubt many of you will be doing it for injuries and safety within your organizations. And you just have to look at it from a well-being and a mental and physical health perspective to identify what your lead and lag indicators are. If you don't understand lead and lag indicators, I'm sure you can Google it or drop us a note um, and, and we can help in any way or contact Harry and Jack with, with the team. They'll have a lot of information to be able to send you. Um, but I think when you're looking at things like your KPIs, you've got to do regular surveys. We did surveys constantly of our teams across Thames, and it's not just one annual thing. Bite-sized surveys are really good in terms of getting it. Every month at the lead team meeting, um, our team actually got feedback on all the click rates from anything that we sent out. So if you have that ability within your organization, then look at what's being communicated, what's being clicked on, i.e. what people are reading, and then you can also delve in the, the, into how long they're reading it. The media nowadays um, is, is very good in terms of what you can gather from your data. Um, so don't be afraid to workshop out and, and you don't need a massive amount of people to be able to workshop. Several people in a room being able to actually start thinking about what do we want to collect and then start reaching out to organizations that are maybe doing different things to you. One of the best things about, in my experience, business at the minute is certainly around health and well-being as it's become far more topical as celebrities, sports personalities are all started speaking openly about their mental health and physical health. So to have um, uh, society because society's in business. And if you actually start gleaning that information, you will get to the right KPIs. Uh, but there's lots of information out there on KPIs. So have a look. Um, uh, you can measure all sorts. Thank you, Carl. Um, and I think that that's the key thing is what is it that you want to measure, first of all, um, and working backwards from the KPIs then through to the data. And another key element that you mentioned as well is transferring that data into action. Um, and Gethin Naden, who's the, the um, head of well-being at, at Benefex, uh, mentioned in one of our previous live sessions that there's nothing that engages employees more than asking them what they want, but there's nothing that disengages them more than not then delivering on it um, and the tumbleweed going through. So um, really echoes everything that, that you mentioned within there, Carl. Um, Jack, we've got a question for you um, from Emily um, of how do you feel it's the, the best way to communicate to the team when they are bombarded with messages would love to know more about that, Jack, and the comms team that you mentioned. Yeah, that's it's really difficult because we have so many emails coming in, it can then just get lost or doesn't have the impact. So it's not just about sending out those emails. But for me, it was also working with our line managers and then our senior leadership about right at the start of every meeting, we have all these all staff meetings, we have these mini meetings, these one to ones. Are we spending that first five minutes? kind of talking around well-being or, or pushing that performance well-being agenda or simply asking people how they are um, and and for me that then changes what everyone's been saying here that that cultural shift to then be oh this is a priority so that was a big part of our communication was also just getting the people to do it because it's far more effective if there's a human being you know at champion health we're a tech company but we're very passionate about the human beings delivering that tech and that's no different with our well-being agenda and our communications if we can get the human beings delivering it it will have far more genuine impact because people will know that the people actually believe it they give the permission around well-being the role modeling's there all of, of all of those great things so for me get creative get people involved and if you have a workforce i had a workforce that were all production all over the place whether that was 
somewhere in the world filming the new documentary or film how do we access those people it can be as simple as are we putting up posters and as, as things like that you don't have to be too creative all the time or, or too fancy and new so be creative get people involved uh, don't always look at emails and I think it's the easiest one to do is just email, 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 um, and not always the, the most well responded within there as well. Um, Bethany, um, a quick question for you in terms of wellbeing champion networks. And so we mentioned senior leadership and I'd love to go into a bit more depth, but we've got around five minutes left within here around empowering senior leaders. Um, but Carl, Carl and Sarah have covered that in terms of then um, sort of looking at bottom up side to side within the organization, as well as top down. How can we build out those champion networks that people can then start shouting about well-being from the rooftops within there? Yeah, I, I think um, it all comes back to them being empowered. Um, so once you've kind of identified this lovely hot pot of bubbling energy, how are you going to work with them to make sure that they can make change on an ongoing basis and they stay excited? So I think, you know, it can come back to the really basic stuff. If you can negotiate a budget, hand it over to them. You know how do they want to work with that um and you can ideally get that signed off by senior leadership so they don't need to keep checking back in um and then i think it's just um you know coaching coach them see how you can help them grow and develop how can you make sure they're still listening and they're getting that feedback on what they're doing so that they can do that continuous improvement loop and also not being afraid to kind of experiment and rebrand you know we've gone through various iterations we have an overall strategy but actually we plan our events on a quarterly basis so that we can respond to the needs that are kind of coming up and what's relevant at the time especially for the last year because things have been changing so quickly um so yeah i think those are kind of my top tips and i guess the other thing is just to keep the faith i know sometimes it can be a bit tiring and lonely if you're banging the drum and you know maybe you don't see the results straight away but sometimes it's a drip drip and people might not hear the first time they might hear the fifth time and that could be the thing that actually saves someone's life so yeah, keep the faith yeah and it, it did I, when i used to say it and um and i three years ago as, as many of the attendees may know i lost my friend and mentor um to suicide that was a two-week bout of workplace stress um now that was someone that had been mentally in a very good place had never suffered with um a mental health diagnosis or poor mental health previously um and what could have happened within those two weeks that you just ask so many what if questions but it's just echoing the point that you've just made it's not melodramatic saying it could literally save someone's life within there as well um and i think that's hugely important um also just reiterating what you mentioned within there bethany um juliet just said needed to hear that in terms of keep the faith um, Carl mentioned the timelines as well. It's not a quick fix. It's not something that will happen just overnight. It will take time. Um, and I think a lot of people on this call will, will need to hear that. So thank you very much for sharing. Now, before I conclude, what I'd love to do is just get one key thought from the panel. We, we may run over by two minutes, but just one final top tip from all of the panelists within here around the best way to drive engagement with well-being. So Sarah, are you happy to, to kick off? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, my top my top tip is, um, well, it, it is do that stock take. It's, it's really understand how people are currently listening to you and start there. Um, so just, yeah, talk to your IT team, talk to your comms team, talk to me, get in touch with me. I might be able to help. But just, just do that stock take first thing. How am I already successfully communicating with employees. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Bethany? Um, this is really tough. I've got two. Can I, <laughs> can I yeah, take yeah. advantage and go double? Oh, okay. Absolutely. The first one is um, don't do it alone. So harness the support that you have around you within the business, um, but also look outside. Events like this are great for networking and getting ideas. Um, my second one is everyone has heard the phrase never waste a good crisis. But actually, there are moments of truth in people's working lives where you can choose how you respond to that, um, whether to make a difference and support their well-being or to go back to a policy. And I think it's those moments that you can work with managers on that, that can make a huge difference. Those are my two. Brilliant. Thank you, Bethany. Um, Carl? So I would say um, it's not the physical or psychological health condition an individual may have that prevents them thriving at work. It's the environment in which they are placed. 
And if coronavirus has taught us anything, it's that, you know, coronavirus has made working from home socially acceptable. Yeah. So we have a great opportunity as the pandemic eases uh, to be able to set up working environments that are much more flexible and suited to the individuals to juggle the demands and pressures of modern day working. So any mature or any good company now will be looking at how do I get the best out of my people moving forward um, through addressing their needs. Fantastic, thank you, Carl and Jack. Thanks for putting me last on this after all these <laughs> stuff. Um, so for me, and this is communications, but it's everything. Make it easily accessible, which Mark's just put in the chat and, and is completely right. Easily accessible, make it attractive, and then make sure there's the human element. And I think those are the three most important things in every decision that you make if you want to drive engagement. Thanks. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for, for all of that. I've actually made just a couple of notes um, into, well, loads of notes, but only a couple of them I'm going to read out in terms of what the panelists have said. Um, Sarah talking about senior leaders and really getting them bought into it, and, and so did Carl. Um, Sarah also mentioning not every organisation is the same. Um, and whilst there are a lot of excellent resources, the only way that we can really learn is by doing um, and learning that way. Um, Carl mentioning we're not robots, that's really stuck with me um, and that we're human beings. We do have lapses in concentration, and that's okay. But we need to do everything with the environment to make sure that that is suitable for the employee to thrive. Bethany talking about that we're all human beings um, at, the, at the end of the day. Again, it's really reinforcing that element that we're not robots within there um, and looking at, again, getting the senior leaders buy-in and not doing it on your own. And Jack talking about, and, and it's everything that you talk about in terms of well-being is high performance. And a few people did mention that as a, as a quote that they're going to take away. So just to wrap up very briefly, um, there's a couple of slides just to run through in terms of claiming your free guide. So we'll be able to um, send through a guide on driving engagement shortly. We've got other guides as well. Carl mentioned the lag and lead indicators, and we can support you with that and making the data-driven decisions. And if you'd also like a free engagement strategy review, we can talk to you about that, and one of our team will be in touch. So just drop us an email following this live session. Now, the final thing is just a huge thank you to Carl, Bethany, Jack and Sarah for giving up their time quite simply. Um, I don't think we could have got a better panel um, in here. The, just the energy has been fantastic. I've been smiling all the way through. And so I've got sore cheekbones now. Uh, but a massive thank you to you all. Everyone else, um, thank you for, for joining this live session and engaging. There have been around 100 messages, and so I'm going to get back to them over the next couple of days. I was hoping to get back to them all and all the questions, but I'll get back to you in the next couple of days, and we hope to see you on the next one. Thank you very much, and have a lovely day all. <laughs>